New York is in a housing crisis and there are two questions up in the air. The first is what are the reasons New York is experiencing a housing crisis? And the second is what is being done about it? Those are the questions we're gonna answer in today's video. My name is Thea and this is Urban Caffeine. Housing in New York, any way you look at it, is expensive. Yes, salaries in New York is generally higher than the rest of the country, but $3,000 to pay an apartment, even if you can't afford it, is a lot of money to pay for an apartment. Even if a person is a high earner, say they make $250,000 a year, that's a quarter of a million dollars. Maybe they're an engineer at Google or one of the hedge funds and they're making that much money. By rule of thumb, your housing shouldn't exceed 30% of your income. So if you were earning $250,000 a year, that's a little over $6,000 a month that you can allocate for housing. And that equates to $75,000 thousand dollars a year. Seventy five thousand dollars a year is another profession salary. That's a lot of money just for housing and there's so much that a person can do with seventy five thousand dollars. And then there are low and medium income earners and because there is a shortage of apartments or houses in New York City, it's hard for someone with a lower income to compete for an apartment. So here are two big reasons, and there are other reasons out there, but two big reasons why we are in a housing crisis is first, there's this imbalance between housing stock, meaning how many houses or homes are available in New York City, and the job growth. From 2010, which is over two decades ago, until now, the amount of homes in New York City grew by only 4%, while the jobs grew by 22%. That's five times more. Jobs attract people, so the more jobs available, there are gonna be more people wanting to move to New York. But since the amount of housing did not keep pace with the job growth, there's not enough housing to go around, so it becomes a competitive market. Another reason why we are in this crisis is the rise in rent. From 2019, which was pre-pandemic, there has been a 40% increase in rent. Let's give some color to that. If your rent or share of rent is $1,500 and it went up 40%, you would have to shell out another 600 per month. $600 is enough to feed a family in New York for half a month. My food allowance for the month is only $400. And if I account for an entire year, 600 a month gives me four extra months of food. I live in a rent-stabilized apartment and here in New York, a rent-stabilized apartment means that the government dictates how much the rent is gonna be increased every year, or every two years, and it's usually one or two percent. This last year, my rent increased by 3%, and I was freaking out. <laughs> I, I contacted my management and asked about it, like, what's going on? Can I negotiate something here? And they sent me the document, the government document, on how much rent is gonna be raised. So I can't even imagine 40%. I'm already here complaining about 3% increase and 40, there, there are people who are experiencing 30 to 40% increase. A lot of this is due to the pandemic because a lot of places lowered their rent by a lot just to keep people occupying the building. But now that's behind us, rent has just shot up to what it was pre-pandemic and even higher than that to probably make up for the loss of income from during the pandemic. So what's being done with all of this? Let's start with zoning. At the state level, there was this proposal called the New York Housing Compact, and there were a lot of exciting things in it. On top of all the money that was being proposed to build more housing all over New York State, there was this proposal where neighborhoods along MTA stations would be rezoned for density, meaning that stations that were in areas that was not residential or you couldn't have any residential buildings would be rezoned so that there would be residential buildings and homes so people could live near stations. This is a no-brainer. I think that people should be living near train stations because having public transit is also access to a lot of things like jobs and other opportunities. However, this year, 2023, the state finished its session without including the New York Housing Compact in its budget. 
Sad to say, these exciting things that I'm talking about are not gonna be realized. At the city level in New York City, just a couple months ago, the mayor announced some new changes to the zoning laws. And these changes are even more exciting. Among the changes, here are three notable ones. The first one is getting rid of required parking minimums. What does that mean? Way back a long time ago, Back in the 60s, there were laws written where depending on the building that was going to be built, whether it was residential, commercial, recreational, or whatnot, there were minimum parking requirements depending on how many units there were in the building, how many, how big is the pool in that recreational building, how many seats are at that stadium. And so this became a problem, especially for cities, because so much space is being allotted to parking when in reality, it doesn't really, they don't really need that much parking. But by law, they have to provide X amount of parking. And this is all over the United States. If you look at a stadium, a football stadium, if you look at the aerial view, it's just sitting in a sea of parking. That's because for every seat that the stadium has, there has to be an X amount of parking. And this is for every establishment. But in New York City, a place where a lot of people do not have cars and it has good public public transit, it doesn't make sense to force buildings, especially right smack in the middle of Manhattan, to force buildings to have parking requirements. Sure, a building can build parking if it wanted to, but it shouldn't be a requirement. Parking lots bother me a lot, actually. When I first started this channel, I asked myself, what's something that bothers me about the world? And maybe that's something I can talk about. And I realized there are two things that bothered me about the world. One is that a lot of people are intimidated to take public transit just because they don't know how to take public transit. And two, as parking lots. I walk around, I see a parking lot with 10 empty spaces. It's just empty, nobody's using it. 10 slots and I'm thinking, this could house another 50 people. Maybe a hundred, I don't know, depending on how tall the building is, but that's such a waste of space. It's such a waste of real estate. Eventually, I do wanna make a video on just parking. I think that's a very interesting topic, so make sure you look out for that in the future. The second thing worth noting in the announced zoning changes is contextual infill. What is that? A good way to explain this is through this picture from Daily News. If an establishment has a one-story property next to a residential building, the residential building could fill in the space above the establishment next door, therefore creating more housing units. In architecture, contextual design simply means designing something that takes into account its surrounding. So in this case, it takes into account that there's a space above an establishment that could also be used for more housing units. And the third notable thing in the September announcement is that garages can be converted into homes. People with large enough property where they can build a second home on their lot will now be allowed to, or at least it'll be not as hard for them to do so. And that too is a no-brainer. If someone had enough space on their lot to build a second home so that they can rent it out and make money themselves, why couldn't they? There still should be regulations around this, but it's silly to make it illegal. And speaking of laws, there are also legislative changes that are being done in order to address the housing crisis, especially with the homeless. Did you know since 1993, that's three decades ago, 30 years, New York City has been paying $33,000 a year for every homeless person. To give you an idea, as of two months ago, there are over 87,000 homeless people in New York City. Multiply that by 33,000 a year, that's over 2.8 billion dollars. 
That's a lot of money. So what is the city doing to address the homelessness? First, for families that are in shelters, there is a 90-day waiting period before they can access a housing voucher. And a housing voucher is basically a voucher that can, you can use to pay for rent. And so the proposal is to lift this 90-day waiting period. Another thing that they propose lifting is a four-month period where a person in a shelter has to be evaluated in order to see if they qualify for housing at all. So the idea behind these two things is to expedite the process of a person leaving a shelter and getting into a proper home. The other thing that's being worked towards is to increase the connection of people with vouchers and actual housing. If I was a landlord, I would welcome someone with a housing voucher because that's assurance that rent is gonna get paid. And then there's just the general effort of building more affordable housing from construction incentives to rezoning areas. Because in order to house people, you need more houses. And it's not just more affordable housing that New York needs. New York needs all sorts of housing. They need lower income housing, middle income housing, high income housing, all of it. If you've ever visited Long Island City in Queens, just across the river from Manhattan, in the last 10 years or five, 10 years, high rises, luxury condominiums, luxury apartment buildings have been popping up like mushrooms. Construction has been going ultra fast. And these are really fancy places. The whole waterfront of Long Island City are all high rise luxury condominiums with their in-unit washer and dryer. That's how you know it's fancy. They have an in-unit washer and dryer. And that's how you know you've made it in New York. And this is not a bad thing. My analogy for this is it's like a sponge. It's a sponge to collect all the high income earners, find housing for them. Because if these buildings weren't there, if these luxury condominiums weren't there, then all these high income earners would be competing for all the other houses in New York City and it's going to be hard for low and middle income to compete for what apartments are left over. In a way, it helps keep rent affordable for everybody. We just need more housing units for all income levels across the board. So I hope this video sparked some interesting thoughts and discussions. If you've made it this far, my question to you is, have you had an interesting housing experience, whether you live in New York or somewhere else? Comment down below. Mine was that my first apartment here in New York, it was a handshake deal. I didn't show an ID. I didn't sign any paperwork. I just said I'll be able to pay my the rent every month. And that was that. <laughs> and in other news, the holiday is upon us. I can't believe we're almost at December. And this video is publishing during Black Friday weekend. And I'm running a promo from now until Monday. If you buy three stickers, you get a fourth one for free. I also updated shipping costs, so international shipping. I have some flat rates available. The way shipping is computed in the system is just insane. So I provided some flat rates for those in other countries so you can buy some stickers. And if you buy some stickers, make sure you tag Urban Caffeine on Instagram. So shop the best merch ever at shop.urbancaffeine.com or the link in the description. Again, thank you so much for watching and until the next video, happy New Yorking.